as I am careening through middle age, uh, I notice myself trying to like check my memories about what it was like when I was younger or how things used to be. So there's a tendency, I think, to automatically think that the time right now is radically different than times in the past. Be that my own childhood, be that American politics 20, 50, or 150 years ago. Of course, if we take a step back, we go, well, wait a second, we had, you know, American Revolution, we had various wars, we had the Civil War to end slavery, we had Reconstruction, up and then down, Jim Crow laws. So I think we take a step back and go, okay, wait a second, this is a very difficult time and it certainly feels very difficult. But across the nation's history, which is even a small snapshot of history more broadly, um, we've been here and worse before, and probably will be again. Though there's some kind of reality check, some grounding in that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pivot Podcast, where we explore how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. I am Alicia Granholm, and I am joined by Dwight Shiley. We live in a time when navigating change faithfully is no easy thing. America is lurching through a tumultuous election season right now, as we all know, and there are powerful forces fragmenting and tearing apart American society. What does it mean to follow Jesus and to help others do so in such a time as this? One of the key pivots we believe the church needs to make today is the shift in focus from attracting and maintaining members of an institution to forming disciples or apprentices of Jesus and his way. And that's why we are so excited to welcome today the Reverend Dr. Anthony Batiza to the Pivot Podcast. Dr. Batiza is the Associate Professor of Religion at St. Olaf College, uh, St. Olaf, I'm gonna do that over. <laughs> Dr. Batiza is Associate Professor of Religion at St. Olaf College, where he specializes in Martin Luther, moral theology, and Christian ethics. And he's also a visiting professor here at Luther Seminary. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's great. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. Okay, Anthony, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in theology and ethics? Yeah, no, it's great. Um, so I teach down at St. Olaf as my full-time job, even though I'm doing some visiting assistant teaching here at the seminary these days. Um, but originally, I grew up down in Iowa. I uh, got brought into the Lutheran Church through campus ministry and kind of went to, into parish ministry for a little bit and then back for a PhD into the academic work. Um, I got into the academic work, particularly like moral theology and Christian ethics questions, driven by uh, an innate bookishness um, that was always kind of there, just a love for learning and reading and discussing more. Um, but also a sense that in parish life, in my own life, trying to find resources to help me think about what it means to be morally formed, to be formed as a Christian. That Lutherans, I think, had a lot of good practices, but don't always have the vocabulary, the concepts, the theology to think through that a little bit more, a little bit more deeply. Um, and so I was drawn back into that and kind of found my home somewhere in the middle of kind of moral theology and political theology. Questions about what we do, uh, is it right or wrong? how we're formed to be the kind of people that we are, and what we can learn from and contribute to the political arenas that we're in, whether that's local, state, or global. Well, so um, we're excited to have you talk with us today specifically about navigating some of that in this moment. What do you see right now if you look at kind of the American landscape? And I know many of our listeners and watchers are trying to lead congregations through this um, kind of rocky season, you know, uh, exciting season, we might say, of American politics. But <laughs> but um, talk to us a bit about how you see that inter intersection of faith and politics playing out in this current moment in American life. Yeah, I yeah, know. I recognize that and appreciate that challenge. There's that old saying, I think, from the Alban Institute, it's a good time to be the church or mm -hmm. the phrase, you know, for such a time as this, yeah. that it can either be inspiring or a hard reality check where it's hard to know, like, is this a good time to be the church uh, because it's more challenging? Um, couldn't I have less challenging times <laughs> and still be pretty good at being the church? Right. Um, so, yeah, I think there's that sort of tension that a lot of us are wrestling with, with in the pews, behind pulpits, or in all kinds of places in our churches and institutions. Um, I think I come at this from a trying to take a bit of a historical step back mm -hmm. when I look around the world today, um, both through my training, through my disposition, um, as I am careening through middle age, uh, I notice myself trying to like check my memories about what it was like when I was younger or how things used to be. So there's a tendency, I think, to automatically think that 
the time right now is radically different than times in the past. Be that my own childhood, be that American politics 20, 50, or 150 years ago. Of course, if we take a step back, we go, well, wait a second, we had, you know, American Revolution, we had various wars, we had the Civil War to end slavery, we had Reconstruction up and then down, Jim Crow laws. So I think we take a step back and go, okay, wait a second, this is a very difficult time and it certainly feels very difficult. But across the nation's history, which is even a small snapshot of history more broadly, um, we've been here and worse before and probably will be again. So there's some kind of reality check, some grounding in that. What I think is true, and I think that the data and the sociological types would support this, is that we are feeling more affective polarization right now. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean it's not just that we have tensions. We've always had those. Not just disagreements, not just outright battles. Um, we've had all of that before. What's interesting right now, or has been a shift recently, folks would say, is in our feelings about people on the other side of a political party, of a candidate, of an issue. That by and large, we feel much more strongly, much more quickly about folks who we detect or believe were on the other side of an issue. And that we're eager to somehow defeat or expel or protect ourselves from those people. That there's this real kind of attempt um, to cut people off and that we're going to somehow purify whatever group we're a part of, whatever candidate or issue we're standing behind, and that the other person is the enemy, um, either because they're malicious or because they're stupid. Uh, and we kind of fall into those two traps both at the same time. We sort of accuse a person of being somehow an idiot, but also a mastermind. Um, and this happens back and forth all over the place. Uh, and so coherence is a bit of a problem there. Um, as it usually is with us. Um, so yeah, in, in that sense, it's an interesting time. Sort of how do you get at um, not just the newness of these tensions and conflicts, but the real in your heart feeling that this is a time where the soul of the nation is at risk and the other person is demonic. So I'm curious on that and use the word soul, which is yeah. I think important yeah. because it seems like there's um, one way to read what's going on is a kind of displaced spirituality mm -hmm playing itself out in the political sphere since religion is less um, predominant in the cultural space than maybe it was yeah. several generations ago um, and more in the background as a more secularized society. And so, so um, how, what, how, how do you see that going on? Do you, do you have a sense of there being a kind of, um, you know, a spiritual like displacement in some of this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I know a lot of uh, Sharper Minds and I have thought a lot about this question about the sort of the lack of attachment to religion in particular or to other people through civil organizations and mm -hmm. community connections and people sort of grabbing onto something, right? It's going to be politics. It's going to be this particular issue that's going to give me a sense of identity, give me a sense of security, uh, and becomes kind of the new quote unquote religion for people. I think there's some truth to that, right? I mean, Luther always warned us about where we put our hearts uh, in the sense that, you know, our faith is that in which we trust and that in which we're investing all of our trust in. And so in the sense that we're investing lots of trust in a politician to win or not win, to do well in a debate or not, to step away and let somebody else who's going to win step in, we're heavily invested in sort of the news alerts and the outcomes of these uh, small skirmishes. And so in that sense, yeah, I think there's probably something there to our having almost a religious connection to our political leaders and our political situation. At the same time, again, doing my like step back historical kind of move, um, I'm, re I'm really interested, for example, in Martin Luther and the reformers' reaction to the German Peasants' War, yeah. uh, which took place in 1524, 1525. Well, what do we see there? Well, we see lots of religion, right? There's plenty of religion all over the place. Plenty of uh, churches, plenty of debates about religion and spirituality and pilgrimages and religion is, is all over. And yet there are deep economic divides, deep political divides, and religion is mixed into all of that. Mm. Um, Luther took it kind of personally uh, and reacted in ways that were sometimes justifiable, other times most certainly not and horrendous. But in his complicated reaction to these Germans who were gathering and then rioting and then going to war, going to battle, um, against the economic conditions they faced. Um, they saw in Luther somebody who was going to help give them some guidance or at least would support them from afar. Why? Well, he wrote Freedom of a Christian and it was printed over and over again. And they thought, yeah, we are, we are free in Christ. 
yeah, I've never thought of that before, but Christ sets us free. We should be free from our feudal lords. We should be free from these new taxes and new burdens they're placing on us. And Luther took a stand against uh, the Pope and against the empire. And they saw that, and he wrote about it sort of boldly with this sort of sense of confidence. And they were like, yeah, we should do that too. And so in that moment, people who had complained in the past, who had rioted in the past, who had gone into battle in the past, primarily for sort of legal and economic issues, brought into their debate religion and said, now we're going to gather as God's people, as God's army, as God's militia, et cetera, et cetera. And so lots of religion, but also lots of conflict, lots of battle, lots of war. And again, time and time again, when we look back, we can see religion is always there when there are conflicts, when there are battles. I feel like a more helpful way for us maybe to approach this is not to just ask, is religion receding and something else stepping into its place in the abstract, but ask, where is religion in the midst of these conflicts, and where are we as people of faith? And uh, I, I, I fear is that there's still lots of religion, but not a lot of people of good faith uh, carrying forward um, religious ideas that, to me, are true, that are good, that are building up the body, both religiously and politically. There's a lot of quasi-religious or dangerous religious ideas, be it Christian nationalism or be it attacks on religious institutions and religion. Anthony, I really appreciate that. And I'm curious, what what do you believe uh, a faithful church's response or right, a faithful faith community's response should be um, in, in terms of public discourse during election seasons? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so I'll take a, get a step back again. Um, this is really a, a good question for our time right now, obviously, as we're looking ahead to the election. Um, but I recall my uh, first call experience when I was first in a congregation. I served out in metropolitan New York uh, back in 2006 to 2010. And I remember one of the lessons that was given to us by then Bishop Steve Bowman about his experience in New York in September 11th, 2001, and the months and years afterwards. Folks would say, you know, if you weren't there before September 11th, if you weren't there in the firehouse, in the police station, in the community, in the hospital, if you weren't there in the community before this tragedy happened, it was real hard and real suspicious if you were trying to get in there afterwards, mm -hmm. right? It just sort of raised questions and you didn't have the relationships, you didn't have the connections kind of already built up in you. So one thing I think that we need to be thinking about is not just how do we prepare for November of 2024, but how are we preparing for 2028 and midterms in 2026 and all the elections in between by thinking about how our congregations, places, where people hopefully have earned and can sustain a little more trust than they certainly can in the comment section on social media or on the New York Times or the Post or the Journal. Um, how are these places where we can constantly be having discussions that are political that might seem A, challenging, or B, not political at all? Kind of reframing both of those things to say we're going to have conversations that we know are already hard on topics that are already difficult, at the same time, we're going to pivot and think about how is it things we take for granted, like supporting our food pantry, like reaching out to neighbors and folks who are different than us, linguistically, culturally, whatever. How are those also kind of political moves? And look at the scriptures that same way, look at our tradition that same way, to kind of constantly be thinking about where is the political already there in ways that people can handle discussing, in ways that will get us out of thinking of the political just as a ballot box a particular candidate kind of thing. Mm. Well, so it seems like for local churches there in leaders, there's a couple of temptations. One is to just say, I'm not going to engage the political stuff at all yeah, yeah. and pretend this isn't happening, <laughs> right? Um, which isn't necessarily most helpful. But another temptation is to be really partisan mm -hmm. and to say, okay, there is a, you know, one moral, morally righteous side to this and we're going to be all in on that and thus silencing people who might have different political views or just pushing them out entirely, yeah. no matter what version that is, left or right. Exactly. Um, so what are some practices that local churches and their leaders might put into place that, um, that do what you're describing, you know, that, that are trust building, that are deepening connections with the neighborhood, but are not falling into either of those two ditches? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to add a third ditch, actually. Mm, great. <laughs> um, and this has been, again, this is more my sort of anecdotal experience yeah. sitting in pews and moving around congregations. Um, I think we have those extremes of people sort of taking hardline stances in different directions, coming at us a lot. Um, my experience has been most of the time I 
feel like I'm in the middle ditch where there's not enough political conversation Mm -hmm. or there's something people think is political but it seems kind of mild and kind of tepid and people are using words like in a euphemistic sort of talking around the issue sort of way that usually it leaves me feeling a little bit more demoralized demoralized than um, anything else and so yeah there was an old um dr ruth just died recently i think it was either her or like a dear abby column i remember reading years ago uh, this is a little risque, but we'll give it a shot for the podcast <laughs> listeners. Um, she essentially said that people write in to me to ask about sex a lot, and their complaints always fall into one of two categories, too much or not enough. Um, and that stuck with me for decades now, just because I was like, ooh. <laughs> um, and it also sort of, I think, again, resonates with my experience of political conversations and some of the stuff mm-hmm. that you were touching on, and that people either say there's too much of it or I want more of it, and there's different kinds of issues people are bringing to it. Um, I would say that that's always going to be the case to some extent. People are probably always going to want a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on the issue, depending on their mood, depending how they're getting fed or not getting fed other places. Um, It's also easier to sometimes yell at your pastors or your church council or your elders than it is other places. It's like when kids come home from school and they've been great for like five hours and they just like vomit up all of their emotions. It's right. my daily experience. Uh, exactly. I also am a parent. Uh, I have been a child, and so it's a it come full circle. Um, so there's something, I think, about congregations and church communities that sometimes invite that kind of people reacting very strongly. And as I tell myself when that's happening with my children, maybe that's a sign of strength. Maybe that's a sign that they feel this is a safe enough place that they can actually share something here that maybe they can't when they're with their family, when they're with their coworkers, when they're with their neighbors in front of the mailbox. So to go into with that kind of attitude, perhaps. Um, and also, I think what's been really effective in my own life, what I've seen others do and try to do myself, is not talk in abstractions about issues. Um, certainly get away from endorsing candidates. That's not our job as the church by any stretch of the imagination. Although the jumps between like issues and candidates can be pretty easy to make. Um, so, uh, but not overtly or explicitly endorsing candidates and that sort of thing. Um, but again, not being abstract and sharing specific particular stories about your own experiences or the experiences others have shared with you in ways that you can do that are appropriate. So don't just, don't just tell me what you think about immigration. Tell me about your experiences with immigrants. Um, if you haven't had any, tell me about that and what you think about that and what that means about your perspective and how maybe you're working to educate yourself um, to expand your circle of relationships, either through reading or ideally through flesh and blood people and contact out in the community or beyond. Um, So I think those kinds of moves towards story, towards narrative, towards experience, um, at least turn down the temperature of, you know, here's the issue and I'm ready with my, with my talking points, my bullets that I'm going to load up and start firing um, about the issue. And instead, I have to listen to you talk about parents and children and experiences in school and experiences at the grocery store and finding the right spices for your recipes and kinds of things we all can relate to. Um, I'll just add, we recently did this. We took a little group um, for a project that St. Olaf was a part of. We did a couple of days of sacred sites tours. Um, we did one day of tours looking at sort of Dakota sites to Fort Snelling and reviewing the history of the people, uh, the indigenous and Native American peoples. And then we did another day, we went to some of the congregations that were Norwegian and were involved in the founding of St. Olaf and learning about their histories and their stories. And just hearing those two stories, those two experiences back to back, people had amazing sort of reflections and observations about what people were paying attention to what kind of historical markers were in the minds of the folks in these different communities who were ostensibly living side by side in the same moment in time, but were having radically different experiences, radically different senses of what counts as history, who they're oppressed by, what they're trying to fight for, what they're living for. Um, So yeah, just getting a sense of our own history sometimes and sort of the political weight of those and sharing those stories. If you don't have current ones, uh, what brought your people to where they are? And if you don't know, why don't you know? And that begins to open the door to having those kinds of conversations about today and people who are facing the same situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, are there ways that you think, uh, thinking about Luther specifically, that his political theology could help us navigate political seasons yeah. like these? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, 
Uh, most certainly, right? I, I think that Luther's political theology and his theology more broadly are very useful. And his personal examples and experiences are useful, I would say, both as positive and negative examples. So theologically, I'll say this. Uh, Luther, as we all know, radically insists over and over again with no breaths ever taken uh, that our identity, that our dignity, that our personhood is ultimately and always grounded in and returning to God. And so whatever way I think of evaluating myself, it's my education, my clothing, my economic status, my immigration or legal status, political party, whatever it is, all of it has to be in some way related to and not determining my, my dignity and worth. Um, my dignity and worth are determined by God. Now, that said, Luther doesn't think that all those things are unimportant. And so he does recognize that we learn about ourselves. We learn about what good relationships look like, what love looks like, what proclamation looks like in these very real and embodied relationships of family and friend, economics and, and politics. And so he's trying to sort of, I think, manage that both and kind of tension of wanting to recognize there's something more to us than the particularities of our lives. And at the same time, those particularities of our lives are deeply important and deeply significant. I also love the way that Luther sort of falls into controversy, kind of, you know, backwards uh, unintentionally, um, merely by criticizing a, you know, not the most important practice of his time, right? So they're selling indulgences. They hadn't sold indulgences that often. They were trying a new thing, trying to raise some money for St. Peter's and to pay off some debts and other historical issues going on there. And Luther is critical of it. And he's critical of it because that's his job. As he's a professor. He's supposed to think about theology and Bible. And so he's just doing that, just doing his sort of mundane, boring job in a backwater sort of corner of the Holy Roman Empire, just out in the woods, away from any centers of power, uh, quite forgettable. And then look where it got him. So I think there's something deeply inspiring about this in our lives as people of faith and people of politics, that sometimes just paying attention to very small things can sort of start to unravel um, what seems like a pretty solid structure or a pretty well-bound uh, piece of cloth uh, falls apart as you keep sort of tugging at just one little loose string. And so I think as we're encouraged politically to take big stands sometimes on just giant banner issues, instead of stepping back and saying, well, I'm a little more interested in just like this little issue. Like I really want to focus on what, what are housing prices like, like in my area, in my town, not sort of inflation or the mortgage crisis across the country or the world, but like, why is it folks can't get a place to rent on these three blocks uh, in, in my neighborhood and kind of start picking at that? And suddenly you might find that there are deeper issues uh, that you're exposed to, uh, challenges you encounter, and opportunities you encounter to engage politically with people of good faith and people of different faiths and no faith uh, in your community. And so Luther did that. Um, and so that gives me some peace of mind of saying, I don't need to have all the answers figured out. I don't need to have like a roadmap to success for how to address political or religious issues. Sometimes just putting your finger on one thing can be enough. Um, I also think that Luther's attention to our sort of simul, our simultaneously sinners and saints kind of identity is really important and gets us out of that desire to want to demonize the other quite so quickly or to demonize ourselves quite so quickly. Um, so you have this sense that you're never going to be perfect. That's not an excuse not to do something. And so you, like Adam, has to be, you know, drowned in baptismal waters every day. So do I. And so you get up, you try again. So if you said something rude to your uncle at Thanksgiving that you feel like you shouldn't have said, then the next day maybe you apologize. You try something else. If you kept quiet when your uncle said something offensive, the next time maybe you speak up, or you give him a call or send an email and try to muster a little courage to put yourself out there. So those are the kinds of daily challenges I think Luther gives us and the kind of permission to keep trying and failing and trying again, knowing that God's love is behind all. So let's talk a bit about the role of scripture in uh, these kinds of political uh, engagements in the life of a congregation. Again, it's easy, it seems like with scripture also to fall into various ditches in how it's used or misused. What would you say to that? I think that's great. Um, obviously, Lutherans, at least we declare a love of scripture. Um, we try to live out. Um, again, like many of our things, we're, yeah, it's easier to declare uh, sometimes than it is to embody. Uh, I'll own that for myself as well in my own body and my, my own life. Um, so yes, I, I think that we have a real opportunity 
because of just the care and attention that Luther and Lutherans like to apply to reading scripture, to interpreting scripture. One of the things I love about the way Luther approaches scripture that I think we lose sometimes is he has almost kind of a Jewish midrashic approach to scripture. By that, I mean, he doesn't always sort of come in and say, this text means this. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he pounds the table. Sometimes he says it has to mean this, and that's fine. But other times when he's giving lectures, when he's sort of musing about things, he'll offer up a variety of interpretations. Maybe Abraham was going through this. Maybe it was this. And here's a third idea I just had. He'll just kind of spin those out for his audience, for his listeners, and for himself, as he's kind of just chewing on the text and letting it work on him in that kind of out loud thinking with other people back and forth. I think that is often missing in debates about what scripture says or doesn't say. Um, we're real tempted to line up a, a series of proof texts to sort of pound on the table and say, no, no, I've got it. Jesus meant this. Abraham meant this. Moses meant this. I've got it all worked out. And that's the end of the story. And said to say, well, maybe we're better off if I toss out some different meanings to kind of let folks offer up and maybe even don't toss out any meanings that others <laughs> offer their interpretation, their read, where they're coming from. Um, I do this sometimes in the classroom whenever I can with students, um, trying to think about stories in ways that are against our first instincts. So we encounter the story of Ruth, for example, Ruth and Naomi. On one hand, it's a story about love and steadfast dedication. On the other hand, it's sort of a troubling story sometimes about a Moabite woman who is called a Moabite many times and then isn't a Moabite anymore. What happened to her Moabiteness? Was she accepted because she took on the ways, the culture, the rules, and the norms uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, or not? Um, then I have students pivot and look at the book of Ezra. Uh, Ezra has this sort of denunciation of intermarriage, um, these wives and these children of intermarriage between Jewish and arguably non-Jewish, although it's debatable, um, folks of the land are broken up and, and dissolved, and people or families are you know, divided and sent away. And our first reaction, I think, often is like, oh, this seems really heavy and really horrible. And we imagine that happening today and thinking that would be a pretty bad and, and pretty traumatic thing. And I think, well, what if you are a very small population living in the midst of an empire where you felt that your language, that your religion, that your culture, that your way of life was constantly threatened, that you had been punished by God, you felt, for not being as dedicated and steadfast in your love of God's law and God's expectations, and you were afraid that punishment might come again. It's one thing if you imagine those marriages being broken up and you're sitting in a very comfortable sort of suburban bourgeois existence. It's different if you're a Native American person wondering about the survival of your language or your culture um, against sort of an over, over onslaughting power of whiteness or other forces outside of your community. So just trying to sort of wrestle with scripture, not to give, again, isn't that one of those readings is right and one of them is wrong, um, but even just posing questions differently or changing our perspective um, gets us to look at the text differently and, again, might get us to look at other people differently in our communities near and far. Mm. So just to follow up on that, yeah. um, as we think about how Scripture is uh, functions in congregations, and there's certainly there's sermons and kind of the worship context, but what have you found um, – as helpful practices alongside that, that are a little more dialogical, a little more mm. like what you're describing, that kind of, um, let's come in and interpret this together as a community, not just I'm the preacher who's interpreting it on our behalf, or, you know, here's what you should think about it. Um, if Luther was giving lectures, but he was also having table talks and sorting yeah. through things in that way. So um, I think particularly in this season, when scripture can be misused or become weaponized in various ways, sure. Um, what, what does that look like in congregations that are that you've seen that are engaging it dialogically and interactively in a really participatory way? They get it both the deeper layers of meaning that are possible and the diversity of perspectives, but also where scripture can be a shared story that we can all enter into rather than something that separates us. I mean, I think the places I've seen this done best are those instances where individuals and congregations have sort of a loose collection of stories or moments in scripture mm. that they often sort of turn back to or point to in terms of how they think about themselves, in terms of stories or locations in the text or characters or moments that have formed their mission, their sense of vision, their sense of where they are, their namesake. Um, they can kind of remind themselves what those stories have meant. 
Um, to me, that's similar to kind of Luther's insistence on the gospel within the gospel, mm. the sense that, yes, we have the wide, you know, 66 books plus or minus uh, of scripture sitting out before us, but we also sort of have those touchstone moments, those key texts um, that we all, I think, sort of carry in us and, and carry forward. Um, I know some people have a longing for the days of confirmation where students had to memorize like a passage yeah. and like name it and claim it and give it verbatim. I know yeah. that was always the most effective way to do that. But I like the idea at yeah. least, of having passages in your pocket yeah. um, and reflecting on them again in conversation with others and, and asking yourself, how does this really fit with what we're doing right now, with what we're saying right now? Mm. Um, I also think it's uh, sort of interesting that more and more congregations are trying to figure out how to do narrative lectionaries and how to look to other yeah. lectionaries, like the Luminous Lectionary by Dr. Will Gaffney and those kinds of things, where you can sort of come at these texts together um, from a different perspective together and kind of work together and, and be challenged in um, how are womenist scholars and communities and individuals, uh, black folks near and far, reading this text and then move on to a different community perhaps for mm -hmm. another series of conversations. Um, there was a congregation in Northfield uh, this last summer, uh, spring and summer, who was doing a, uh, learning about our Jewish neighbors and siblings and sort of reading a series of books, looking at scripture, having a rabbi in to speak, um, doing these kinds of things where we're going to like really do this intensive, ongoing, multiple opportunities to do our best to both listen and try to inhabit a different perspective, a different viewpoint on these texts uh, kind of openly. And people keep talking about that. So then you have the story of how you did that. Remember that we did mm. that that one time? Should we do it again? Should we do something else? And that becomes a part of your DNA, a part of your sort of ongoing way of living scripture. What would you say might be some common ethical pitfalls that churches and church leaders should avoid when engaging in public discourse? Boy, there's so many ethical pitfalls. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> right? What to choose from. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a real... Uh, um, it's a, it's a real smorgasbord. Um, oh, okay, I'll, I'll pick one that I think hap I exper experienced a lot in Lutheran contexts that also uh, picks up with something that I, I hinted at earlier where I said Luther sometimes gets things wrong or sort of says things that don't quite sound right or resonate with me today. Um, Christians love love. Right? We love talking about love and Christian love. We love printing it on, on mugs, on banners on t-shirts and swag around the congregation. So we love talking about love. Sometimes we use the Greek word agape, and this gives us a sense that we're getting at something more Jesus-like or more, more God-like um, because we're using a Greek word. Um, and there have been just sort of piles and piles and pages spilled on how is it that Christian love is so different than other kinds of love that we experience in the world? And how is it that God's love is so radically different than other kinds of love that we experience? I worry about all of that, um, everything that I said there. Um, I understand what people are going for. I understand what some scholars in the past have gone for and trying to emphasize how is Christian love, how is Christ's love different than other experiences of love. But I wonder about trying to define ourselves so strongly through difference, I'm trying to say what is it that we have or that God is giving that we don't experience anywhere else, when I think that we do experience it all kinds of places. Um, you know, we don't experience only sacrificial love through Jesus. We experience it through family. We experience it, hopefully, through friends, through community, from political leaders, either, again, because they're taking sacrifices on themselves or they're refusing to or asking others to sacrifice things that they ne themselves would never give up, never be willing to give up. And so I think, again, if we're attentive to that fact that we don't sort of get locked into this Christian community is one thing, God's love is one thing, and human relationships and communities, they're always going to be different. Uh, that gets us into the trap of thinking that politics is always anger, always battle, that the church is always love and warmth. I think there's love and warmth in both those places and plenty of battle and blood spilled in both those places. I also think that following that same kind of love line and the ethics, ethical mistakes we can make, Luther, when he was responding to the German peasants, responding to lots of people sometimes, Look to this idea of suffering as a criteria, as a way to sort of measure whether or not you are loving in a Christian way. Mm -hmm. And so he, for example, was critical of the peasants because he's like, oh, you're just trying to get economic things. You're out for yourselves. You're self-interested. You're not concerned for your neighbor. And if you really loved as Christ loved, you would just, you know, <clears throat> grin and bear it and suffer and, and pray to God to change it 
and just kind of keep marching forward. And that seems wrong, both as a reading of scripture, a reading of Jesus. Uh, theologically, there's just all kinds of issues there. I understand instances where that makes sense. There are times when I need to hear that message from others or from myself. You know, suck it up, Anthony. <laughs> right? Um, sometimes I'm going to like meetings that I don't want to go to, right? Or I have bureaucratic paperwork to do. And I'm like, Faculty I don't want meetings. exactly. I don't want to fill out that Excel spreadsheet. Uh, these these spreadsheets are all made up and arbitrary. I, I gotta, I'm going to fight this this uh, uh, oppression put upon me. Um, and then I'm like, no, it just it it is maybe kind of a waste of time. Sometimes a lot of bureaucracy is, and yet it's your responsibility. People need you to do it. Just, you know, suck it up and do it. Um, you know, and that can go on to other more serious or substantial issues. But I think Luther, in this focus on love and suffering, sometimes misses that um, when we're advocating for ourselves, sometimes we're also advocating for others. The peasants were fighting for their economic status and their economic well-being, not just individually, but collectively. So it wasn't that they were being entitled. It wasn't that they were being uppity. They weren't sort of being um, people who were looking for welfare handouts of some kind. I just kind of use more of our modern language. They were folks who were arguing for themselves and whole swaths of the community that were being denied what they were already due by justice, what they were already owed by right, what had been taken from them and all kinds of backroom and other machinations. So I think that Christians, and a lot of preaching I hear sometimes, particularly in certain contexts, slide into a, you know, we need to be more loving. As Christians, we're going to just show them how loving and kind and not angry we can be, when sometimes it's more loving to show people how angry we actually are, to name the things we're angry about, and to listen to others as they receive or reject what we're talking about, and to keep that going. Um, that is one of the beauties of the church and of being people of God, is that even though we have elections coming up, even though we have sort of dates on the calendar that are very important, even though our lives eventually run out at some point on the calendar, I think, I hope that we have a, a bigger sense of time of eternity and recognizing that we can't sort of cast people away. We're not going to win something once and for all. We have to keep returning to these things over and over again. And so when we're using ethics and morality and religion as a weapon, as a cudgel to try and win, um, that's an ethical mistake um, of, a, of a deep kind that misses our sense of time and eternity and where God is in all of those. So one last question for you. Um, where are you finding hope in this particular season? And um, what would you say to those leaders or listeners out there who are struggling to, um, to identify hope in a challenging time for the church, not just because of the political season, but just all the changes going on in our society, institutional challenges that are facing many congregations and conflict that is heated within them and things like that. Where are you finding hope? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start with the second part. I'll start with the, the, the pastors and leaders and folks in congregations. Um, I hope this is hopeful. We'll see if, if I get there. But, <laughs> well, if it's hopeful for you, yeah, that's what matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's permission giving me, and that, and that okay, to me yeah. is a kind of hopefulness. Um, so I think that sometimes pastors are really worried about where their congregations are going to go. Mm -hmm. um, sort of financially, institutionally, are going to be open in six months, in six years? What's the trajectory look like? And at the same time, they're also really committed to caring for and loving the people that they've been given and the people that they're reaching out to. And so they don't want to hurt people. They don't want to push people away through their action or through their inaction, through things done or things left undone. And I want to recognize and just name all of that. And I want to encourage pastors to do that as well. And again, in ways that are appropriate and contexts that allow for dialogue, um, not just sermons about how like you're carrying a heavy load, worried about the church, and then you sit down and, and call, that, call that a Sunday morning, um, but really to opening up venues for conversation, for sharing your worries, where they're coming from, and letting others sort of help build you back up and give you their own stories of hope, their own chance to reinvest, to recommit in ways that they maybe not even, didn't even know that you needed or that the church needed. I also think that pastors can put a lot of weight on themselves when there's a conflict in the church, mm -hmm. either because of something they did or something they didn't do. And that generates a bit of anxiety, a bit, a bit of fear. And this is where I'm not sure if this is hopeful or not. But we often, I think, point to moments of conflict in the aftermath as a time when things, you know, bad things happened in the church. 
Uh, we brought up Becoming Reconciling in Christ, and five families left, and we lost this funding, and there's this deep focus on this moment and perhaps a tension or conflict that it generated. I think what's harder for us to pay attention to is not that one moment, but all the moments before and after that. Uh, the people who wander into and out of the church for all kinds of reasons, um, being drawn to your family ministry, being drawn to your preaching, to your music, to your activism in the community, or being repelled by not having those kinds of things. Folks who slip away quietly, not because they're storming out angrily, but because they just get bored or get distracted or get drawn away by other things. And so recognizing that all of that is sort of happening before you, I think that takes down the temperature and the, and the fear about saying the wrong thing about a hot button issue being the thing that's gonna make or break the church. There's not one thing that will make or break the church. There's lots of things. So that can be anxiety producing as well. <laughs> lots of ways things could go bad, but also lots of ways things that can go well and that can go amazingly well and miraculously well. People might be drawn to your church because of what one you know kind elderly person in a pew says to the visitor next to them. It might make or break your church for the new families that come in in ways that you couldn't plan for, can't predict, and can't control, you know, much like God and the Holy Spirit. Um, so kind of, again, stepping back from our own importance, our own involvement, um, not to absolve ourselves from getting involved, but to recognize that we're only involved in what God is doing. God has been doing things before we got there, and we'll keep doing things long after our passing. So the places that I see hope are in all those kinds of moments where I've experienced a sense of sort of miraculous grace at people's willingness to talk about things, to ask me questions, people's willingness to push back on me and to challenge me to sometimes do less or to do more. Um, and that to me says that these are people who are invested in me, that they're invested in this community and that God is working in and through them. And so I can point to those places and feel a sense of, you know, that's where I see love and that's where I see grace. I may not have the perfect biblical passage or the perfect theological interpretation, but I can point to and tell stories about these experiences. And it's not speaking in tongues, it's not rising from the grave, um, but it's the kind of speech and the kind of resurrection that I need on a daily basis. So. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us, yeah. Anthony. It's been great talking with you today. We've loved having you. It's been my pleasure, truly an honor. And thank you for all your work of trying to connect these messages about life and theology and politics to folks where they are. It's, it's awesome. Oh, thank you. And to our audience, thank you for joining us on this episode of Pivot. To help spread the word about Pivot, please like and subscribe if you're catching us on YouTube. And if you're listening, go ahead to the Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. It really does help. Finally, the best compliment you can give us is to share Pivot with a friend. Until next time, this is Dwight Shiley and Alicia Granholm signing off. See you next week.